A very good morning to all of you, and it truly is a privilege to be sharing with you in worship, especially on this Veterans Day. I give my heartfelt thanks to all of those who have served this nation at whatever point, whether you are still serving, have served, even if you've wanted to serve. This is a day where we acknowledge the fact that we give ourselves for the freedom of this country. And to each of you, I give you thanks. Would you pray with me? Gracious and almighty God, for this opportunity to hear your word. Help us to realize that though we bring so many things to this moment, we bring feelings, we bring experiences and memories, we lay them down before you, that in all that we are and all that we hope to be, that you would transform us, that we would glorify you in our lives. We pray these things in the strength of Christ's name. Amen. I should warn you, this sermon has some details in it which might find, uh, some may find disturbing. There are some thoughts in here, much like the Book of Lamentations, which conjure up in ourselves, in our own spirits, perhaps some discomfort. Please know that if any desire to talk to someone following the service, that there will be people available in the Holy Spirit Chapel, which is to the left of where most of you are seated. It's been said that a picture is worth a thousand words. Let me call to mind a few images that you may have seen throughout the years. There's that lovely painting by Arnold Freiberg of George Washington in prayer at Valley Forge. There's a Marine on his knee leaning on his rifle. His head is bowed. There's a circle of about 20 soldiers, arms wrapped around each other's shoulders, standing just to the side of the convoy of vehicles in prayer before going outside the wire. And then there's a drawing by cartoonist Dave Granlund of a family in prayer at a Thanksgiving table, but there's an empty seat. And on that seat, there's a picture of a service member taped to the back of the chair. And then there are the host of homecoming videos that flood our Facebook pages. Some of the words that come to my mind are words like poignant, inspiring, moving, pensive, loving, and heartwarming. But I'd like to tell you about some other photos. On the 31st of October in 2006, Lance Corporal Juan Valdez Castillo had just been shot by a sniper on a foot patrol in Karma, Iraq. The sniper's bullet had passed through Lance Corporal Valdez Castillo's upper arm, entering into his upper torso and exiting his back. Helpless and unable to stand, exposed, Lance Corporal Valdez Castillo, a father of two young children, was in grave peril. He was both at risk of being shot again and in danger without immediate aid of bleeding to death. He tried to right himself, but he fell back. A Marine Sergeant, Jesse Leach, stepped into the line of fire, walked backward while scanning for whomever had shot his radio operator, and reached the fallen man. He found the strap on the back of his flak jacket and dragged him single-handedly across several yards of ankle-deep mud, stopping only when he had the wounded man hidden behind a small stand of reeds. And then he began slowing what seemed to be this Marine's slide toward death. The sergeant set down his rifle, pulled out a knife, cut away Lance Corporal Valdez Castillo's uniform, and began to treat the flowing wounds. Thankfully, Lance Corporal Valdez Castillo survived. We have this story, this, this incredibly dramatic image, because Jal Silva, a photographer for the New York Times, had been walking near Sergeant Leach and Lance Corporal Valdez Castillo that day. He himself was exposed, but he took a knee and in the open calmly documented the whole event. And from his pictures, Thousands more words come to mind. 
faithfulness, devotion, commitment, heroism, sacrifice. Fortunately, some of these demonstrations of these incredible virtues, these words that flow from these acts of heroism, these gestures of sacrifice, these are the threads to the fabric of the 244 years of our country's military history. Many have been captured on film and canvas. Even more have not. There are thousands of undocumented experiences that speak of poignant, inspiring, and moving moments. Which means that there are thousands of more words to express that unequaled devotion, that unwavering commitment, undying spirit, fortitude, and faithfulness. These are the words that describe those who wear the cloth of this nation. But I've laid out a number of images for you to ponder, but for all the stories and images that all of that that these portray, whether they've been recorded or whether they're being recounted at the local VFW, an exponential lexicon remains unspoken. They are unable to fully convey the tactile experience of these scenes, the sounds, the smells, the surroundings. And, and much of this is even more challenging to record, whether in film or in writing. Even fewer talk about it, or even rarely acknowledge all that takes place on the battlefield. Are there even any words to describe it? What is the unseen and unknown impact on the souls of all those who are involved in these moments, on those who are present and very much active, or those who stand and wait for their return home. The repercussions of each and every trauma, the multitude and accumulation of traumas that come before and after having been in war, these reverberate for years in the lives of service members and those who love them. The day before Lance Corporal Valdez Castillo was hit, the photographer Zhao had made an equally arresting photograph of another Marine, minutes after he had been shot through the head. But because there was no life-saving act of heroism, no story of sacrifice. There was then no story in the times to document the loss of that life, nor the aftermath of guilt of his battle buddies, the grief of those who loved him, and the suffering that surely followed. Yet for those who were there, and for those who grieved at home when they learned the news, the image begged so many words an expression somehow to tell the story of a life now unnamed that was lost. There are even more moments like these where there was no one to record these traumatic events. And yet many of those who have worn the cloth of this nation carry those images with them day after day after day. No matter how good the image, no photojournalist or artist will ever be able to illustrate the wrestling of the human soul. There's an unease that is as much a part of the warrior experience as the countless demonstrations of heroism and sacrifice. There's a spiritual wrestling that takes place in the midst of and as a result of the ordeals that emerge from the battlefield. There is a depth of feelings that linger for perpetuity. A couple years ago, the movie American Sniper attempted to pull the curtain back on this combat experience. It revealed that sense of one foot in and one foot out, known to so many service members post-deployment. 
That one foot that's still in theater, still in combat, still with their battle buddies. Then there's one foot at home, the familiar and the family. One foot trapped in the snare of residual torment, the other desperate to be free, to move forward, to live. One foot or part of the brain or heart, proud of the privilege to serve for the cause of freedom, but the other overwhelmed, even plagued with uncertainty of value or purpose. Coming home means leaving something behind. For all the photos, the stories, the movies, the recordings, the thoughts, the memories, it is clear that none of this is new. For centuries, those who have gone to war have borne this burden, they and their families. And then when we read the book of, Revel of, of uh, Lamentations, it's called that for a reason, for the, the one who speaks is lamenting centuries of sadness and grief. It's not a very long book, thank God. But it, with five past chapters, it is filled with expressions of grief and mourning. The author has experienced the total upheaval of his surroundings. He laments the loss of everything that he's valued. He sits in the midst of life's battlefield bereft. I am one who has seen affliction. He has brought me into darkness without any light. Against me alone he turns his hand again and again, and again and again he tells of how his flesh and skin waste away. He's besieged with bitterness and tribulation. He calls and cries for help. But the Lord shuts out his prayer. The Lord has made him desolate. He's become the laughingstock of all his people. He's bereft of peace. He has forgotten what happiness is. I hear that chapter and I, I picture so many people I've encountered. Young men and women who have just joined the service and have found themselves in the throes of something they had no idea what to expect or how to handle. A new recruit hunkered down in his barracks, left with his own thoughts that life has overtaken him. Home from the war, his friends have died, his girlfriend has left him. The innocence he knew not so long ago is no more. Yes, it's the new recruit, but it's also the words of someone who's been there and done that for years upon years and countless deployments. The author of Lamentations speaks like a, a sergeant or a, or a platoon leader who, though a little more able to step outside of himself and his own personal losses, nevertheless lies awake in the comfort of his marital bed, distraught over the casualties. He loves his battle buddies, his fellow Marines, his shipmates, in some ways, the way he can't love his family. The weight of each responsibility lays heavy on his soul. He grinds his teeth on gravel and cowers in ashes. And yet, in all of this, if only for a moment, like one frame in a film, this warrior proclaims the certainty he has in the steadfastness of his sustainer. In all of this, he asserts his faith in the faithfulness of God. It's a fleeting image. And yet the depth of expression of his faith is worth a wealth of words. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. Consider also the passage from Jeremiah. It too has some pretty powerful imagery. Inspiring and devoted in commitment, 
it's moving, it's faithful, it's a photograph, it's a snapshot on the journey home. It too speaks volumes. The documentation of survivors who proclaim that even though they are now left blind and lame, those who are with child and in labor, with consolations they are being led back. And the film documents that with weeping they came, and they are allowed, however, to walk by brooks of water. They are kept from stumbling. Together, a great company, they return home. These images of faith in the midst of suffering are documentation of the survival God intends for us. God who drew us from the land of the north and gathers us from the farthest parts of the earth, he calls us to, calls to us in the midst of our suffering today. That our souls would also hear the words of hope and that we would hold on to the rich vocabulary of faith, that we would experience the ministrations of ministry that he gives to us each morning. You see, this is why those images that I started off with are so captivating. When we see leadership in prayer, when we see a Marine on his knee, his head bowed, when we see a circle of soldiers holding on to each other, when we see a family united together at table, this is a narrative we share. It's a narrative of faith in the face of adversity and faith in the midst of our spiritual wrestling. This is what speaks volumes. It's the story that we tell when we approach the altar. We tell the story of one who suffered, endured excruciating pain and betrayal, of one who in fact died at the hands of his enemy and whose death is captured in countless works of art and film. This is the story that we as believers, as Christians, proclaim and claim when we own our story that has been given to us in Christ. The story of our Lord Jesus Christ has assured us that even death does not have the final line in our script. But in the redemption we receive, our guilt, our grief, our trauma is placed into the context, a much larger context, an eternal context of faith and hope. And when we approach the altar, we discover words like broken and sacrificed. And these words liberate and sanctify and heal us. And in Christ's story, we are assured that our experiences, our bitterness, our desolation does not define us. But in hearing of Christ's love for us, of Christ's sacrificial gift to us, we are led home through the valley of death to the table he prepares for us. And what a homecoming it is. For we discover that when we are received into the banquet, we are reunited with all those who have gone before us the heroes we've lost, the battle buddies we left behind, the company of saints, the sinners who have been redeemed to sainthood. In this gathering, when we come together in the Lord's name, it is in this gathering where the overwhelming photos, the films, the stories recorded in the stark reality of life are transformed. We are transformed. Come home. Come home and feast on the mercies of our merciful God. Amen.